Ken Burns, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Christiane. You have been very vocal about the dangers that lie ahead from a historian's perspective. Let me play a little bit of your commencement address to the Stanford graduating class. You don't mention Trump by name, but you mention uh, him in, in all the aspects that you're talking about. This is what you said, or this is some of what you told the students. A person who easily lies, creating an environment where the truth doesn't seem to matter, who has never demonstrated any interest in anyone or anything but himself and his own enrichment. And asking this man to assume the highest office in the land would be like asking a newly minted car driver to fly a 747. You talk about lies, and elsewhere in your commencement address, you say the sense of commonwealth, of shared sacrifice, of trust, so much part of American life, is eroding fast, spurred along and amplified by an amoral internet that permits a lie to circle the globe three times before the truth can get started. Is that how he has managed to put his candidacy across so successfully because of the way he is engaging with people via the internet. Things uh, that would occupy weeks of our conversation now are spoken and then forgotten in a day or so and what happens is we begin to uh, accrue a sense that the truth doesn't matter anymore. We don't think that. We're absolutely certain we know what the truth is. But when you hear somebody lie over and over again about almost every aspect of this campaign, it's really hard to keep up with it. And I, I think that's where the historians are, are taking a big time out and saying, look, we have to look at this. A person who was a supporter of Hillary Clinton, a donator to Hillary Clinton's campaigns uh, uh, in the past and has been uh, pro-choice and is suddenly pro-life and, and won't release his actual wealth. We don't know whether he's paid taxes or not, whether he's given to charitable contributions is all over the map on everything, and yet the sheer spectacle of him overwhelms the, the normal kind of due diligence that we must, in a democratic society, uh, apply to our candidates. There was a moment in Franklin Roosevelt's early in his first term in the midst of the depression when some aide said to him, you know, you're either going to go down as, as the worst president or the best president. He said, if I don't succeed, I'm going to be the last president. And I think there's an anxiety among those of us who understand uh, the sort of in and out of American history, how incredibly perilous our situation is right now. You have said the five black teenagers who show that Trump will do more harm than good with race relations. And by that, you're referring to the film that you did called The Central Park Five. It's a, it's, it's a story that I covered when I was in New York. Uh, these five blacks uh, and a Hispanic boy who were arrested, jailed for a crime they didn't commit. And Donald Trump took out full-page ads in all of the New York dailies asking for the return of the death penalty and essentially saying that these innocent 14-year-old children, 15-year-old children, a developmentally challenged 16-year-old child should be put to death. Uh, and that was, and, and, and you're in our film, Christiane, reporting on, on this, and while the laws of New York State would have forbidden the execution of these children, the fact that he would play that race card so blatantly and has continued to do that throughout his life. It is the tactic of the demagogue to make enemies of the other, and it, it offers a kind of temporary assurance to those people who are susceptible to these messages. But in the long run, it's actually those people who will be voting against their self-interest if they vote for Trump that will suffer the most. As I said at Stanford, of governance. It's not sexy. It doesn't make for lead stories the way the bombast always does. Um, if we choose our head instead of this kind of gut instinct to go against others, we'll be saved. If we follow the latter, uh, we'll be in great danger. The United States' economy is actually right now doing very, very well and can offer a bulwark for the rest of the world. I have never in my life come forward and spoken as I have this time. All of my films have been consciously neutral, but there comes a time when you have to say, we have to wake up. This could be like Germany uh, in, in the early 30s or Italy in the early 30s, and the world cannot afford that again. Well, you've talked about the early 30s in Germany and Spain, and your new film is called Defying the Nazis. I mean, it's an amazing 
time to be doing this film. If, if you go back and look at Hitler's rise, uh, and I'm not in any way equating Donald Trump with Adolf Hitler, but he does have a kind of proto-fascistic aspect to the way he handles it. But Hitler's rise, he would say some outrageous things and expect sort of to have his sails trimmed, and they never were. And so he would say it again. He doubled down. He tripled down on it. And what we're having is we cannot... I mean, if Edward R. Murrow were alive today, he would have exposed this naked emperor a long time ago. And David McCullough, I was speaking to him the other day, the eminent historian, and he was just recalling the Army McCarthy hearings when the Army's attorney, Joseph Welch, said, have you finally no sense of decency, no sense of shame? Well, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Joseph McCarthy. Uh, is it significant to you that Donald Trump's most important mentor was Ro Roy Cohn, the lawyer it, uh, who uh, was Joseph McCarthy's lawyer. Roy Cohn was his mentor, Donald Trump's mentor. Donald Trump is a product of that the least, the lowest common denominator is not the better angels of our nature. This is not a liberal or conservative, Republican or Democratic, red state or blue state issue. This is an American issue. We, as an American people, reject this kind of thing. And I think when, we've, when we have a responsible media that can report on this and has historical perspective and context, we permit our citizenry to understand what Alexander Hamilton said about demagogues. Uh, what Roy Cohen was doing with uh, McCarthy and, and what he apparently taught uh, his pupil, Donald Trump, very well. But is there something about people's needs that he has tapped into that establishment yes. politicians are simply not, not, not tapping into, ignoring? It's called fear, Christiane. It's called fear. And when you appeal to people's fear, if you convince them through months and months of rhetoric that the United States economy is going to hell in a handbasket, and it's not, it's had, you know, 73, four months of job growth, uh, it's solid. Uh, if you convince them that it's bad, that every person of color or every immigrant is coming over has criminality on their mind, it is in fact indicative of the kind of position Position we've put ourselves in and we are obligated as Americans to sort of so say stop no this will not stand we understand that there are tough times and complexity can only be met with thoughtful and complex uh, solutions it, it doesn't come from the easy solutions it only works that way on reality television you only get to say on real reality television you're fired and that's it and you can take care of it but when we talk about the flaws of donald trump we are talking about orders of magnitude far beyond even the perfidy of say a richard nixon and so it is just from some one humble opinion and not even as a democrat because i keep that politics out of my day-to-day -day work but as an american citizen who loves his country it is time to just say no ken burns thank you very much indeed thank you